On August 25, 2002, a woman whose name has not yet been released went on a short vacation to spend time with friends in Cheshwitzi Forest Park, which is located in Chunhua County, Taiwan. She arrived first, parked her car next to the Cheshwitzi Trail, and went to look for a place to urinate. As soon as she crossed the ditch on this trail, she was alerted by an acetone-like odor. The woman began searching the area and found a raised rectangular hill under an acacia tree with an unnatural amount of vegetation. Plastic bags were slightly visible from beneath the vegetation. Curiosity got the best of her, and the woman pulled the weeds apart, revealing a black plastic bag shaped like a human body. After poking at the bag a bit, she was horrified to see a charred human leg suddenly sticking out. I will. Soon after, the police arrived along with pathologists and forensic experts, launching an investigation. They searched the area for more evidence. Unfortunately, apart from a few more bags and branches under which the body was hidden, nothing more could be found. Four days later, on August 29th, the medical examiner who examined the body provided an autopsy report. Now, the body was that of a woman in her 40s, about 5'10". A large number of fibers were found on her body, indicating that she was clothed at the time of the arson. The death occurred approximately 20 days ago, i.e. between August 1st and 5. Despite the severe burns, it was possible to find suffocation marks on her neck, as well as a dissection of the inner thigh. But the most interesting thing is that a caustic liquid was poured on the face and fingers of the deceased to make it impossible to identify her. The medical examiner found traces of ethanol and neuroleptics in the victim's stomach. The combination of these two substances caused the woman to lose consciousness, after which she was set on fire. On one of her fingers was a plastic ring with a Buddhist symbol and the inscription star in English. It was also determined that the victim had undergone breast augmentation surgery while alive. Investigators noticed that her implant weighed 240 grams, which was illegal and exceeded the 108 220 gram limit under Taiwanese law. Other gold jewelry, such as earrings, were also found. Because all the jewelry was in place, robbery as a motive for murder was ruled out immediately, as was suicide since the woman wore Buddhist rings and her implant size exceeded the legal limit. The officers concluded that she was not Taiwanese and could most likely be from Southeast Asia, such as the Philippines, Malaysia, or Vietnam. And from this, it was a logical assumption that she could have been either a migrant worker or a foreign bride killed by her Taiwanese husband. Based on these findings, Police checked thousands of registered foreign brides and laborers in Chunhua County, but none of the missing matched the description of the body. Officers expanded the search to countries in China, Japan, and Korea, but that also went nowhere. Only one woman from Tanzhuang matching the body description went missing in early August. The police printed out several flyers appealing to citizens about the lead. They investigated for six months, but no one contacted the police station with useful information during that time. The case remained unsolved and the body unidentified. Soon the Chunhua police were contacted by a detective from Tan Zhuang named Zhang Wentum, who had only recently heard the news of the discovery of the woman's remains. It seemed to him that he even knew the victim personally. It was 40-year-old Chen Xinli. On August 4th, Wentum received a call from Xinli's daughter, Tsu Xu Ting, informing him that her mother had disappeared. Who was her mother anyway? And under what circumstances did she suddenly disappear? Little is known about Chen Xinli's childhood and parents, as well as her place of birth. Only information about her life with her husband, 40-year-old Tsu Xinyan, has been found. So that you do not get confused in the names and surnames, I will say at once that the missing woman's name was Tsinli, and her husband was Qinyan. I will continue to tell the story by name. So Tsinli and Qinyan met in Taichung, where they both worked in a steel factory after moving to that city. Their friendship quickly turned into a romantic relationship, 
and they were soon married. After their marriage, they had three children, Tzu Shuting, Tzu Jin, and Tzu Wei. After their children were born, they decided to quit their jobs and open their own metal recycling factory in the Taiping district. It so happened that Xin Li was much harder working than her husband. He had little or no investment in the factory and mostly stayed at home with the children, while Xin Li spent her days and nights at work successfully managing the business. Thanks to her efforts, the factory began to make a substantial profit, which allowed the family to live in prosperity. Around this period, Xin Li became acquainted with Detective Wentum from Taichung through her husband, who was a police informant and often a witness in various theft cases at the factory. When the family began to earn a good income, Xin Yan became even lazier. He started spending the profits on his whims, such as gambling, drinking, and even mistresses. These mistresses and their relatives would often show up at the factory, causing many problems for which the police had to be called in. Wentum, who by then had become almost a friend of the Tzu family, would often come to settle conflicts. This open disrespect and numerous infidelities led to the children being ridiculed and scorned. In 1993, Xin Li could not stand it and filed for divorce. However, for the sake of the children, they continued to live together. A couple of years later, they remarried, but history repeated itself. Divorce and a new marriage in 1997 did not change the situation. Xin Yan continued to cheat on Xin Li. Each year, Xin Li found it more and more difficult to put up with her husband's affairs. The year 1999 was especially difficult when Xin Yan's adultery was exposed. In the summer of that year, Xin Li hired a woman named Lai Huichi as an accountant. Huichi's situation was dire. Her husband had recently been imprisoned for theft, and he was the sole breadwinner for their small family. Xin Li took pity on her and gave her a job in her factory. But instead of being grateful for this kindness, Huichi became Xin Yan's next mistress. When the rumor reached Xin Li's ears, she immediately fired Huichi. However, the affair turned out to be stronger than before and was not limited to one night. After Huichi was fired, Xin Yan rushed to her defense and even made threats. He made all the factory workers refer to Huichi as boss's wife and threatened Xin Li that he would marry his mistress and reinstate her as he had every right as a co-owner of the factory. Never mind that all the work was done by Xin Li and he was only spending money. It's not hard to imagine the desperate situation Xin Li was in. Wanting to prevent this, she asked Wentum to participate in resolving the conflict, and the latter, disliking her husband, agreed. He acted as a mediator between the couple. Wentum managed to convince Xin Yan to take only a small portion of the property and to pay child support for the three children he did not want custody of. But the conflict did not end there. In late 2001, Xin Yan secretly moved into Huichi's house, married her, and opened a new factory by moving two truckloads of equipment from Xin Li's factory. In fact, he stole this equipment. An enraged Xin Li found the new home of her ex-husband and his new wife and caused a scandal, for which she was beaten and humiliated. After the new factory opened, Xin Yan tried his best to lure employees and customers to his place while Xin Li was never able to reach an agreement with the couple. In desperation, she again turned to Wentum for help. Unfortunately, the police felt that the incident was nothing more than a civil dispute. Wentum, being a detective in the criminal division, had no jurisdiction and could not help. Xin Li had to find ways to recover the stolen equipment herself. She was only able to retrieve some of it because Xin Yan and Huichi quickly hired security guards to patrol their factory and went to the police, reporting the theft. The police intervened and warned Xin Li to stop harassing the couple. Xin Yan, believing Xin Li to be gutless and easily intimidated, decided to retaliate further and stopped paying child support. Xin Li was last seen alive on August 2, 2002, when she was playing cards with her neighbor in the afternoon. Xin Yan approached her, whispered something in her ear, and left. It is not known what exactly he said to Xin Li,
but she continued playing cards for another hour and then left and was never seen again. Sin Li's daughter, Xu Ting, told Wentum that her mother was not home when she returned that day and on the 3rd and 4th of August. It was quiet and Xu Ting suspected that her father might have lured Sin Li away and killed her. Wentum shared this suspicion and helped Xu Ting file a police report. However, no action was taken by law enforcement. When an unidentified body was found, Wentum raised the issue again, but the police ruled out the possibility that it could have been Sin Li. Although her height and weight matched, officers were certain the victim was a foreigner from Southeast Asia. Moreover, no one was able to say for sure whether Tsin Li had had breast augmentation surgery. It was also impossible to find underground clinics, and it was reliably known that she had never left Taiwan. After receiving no help from his superiors and colleagues, Wentum decided to investigate on his own. He tried to recruit potential employees of the factory so that once they were employed, they would keep an eye on everything and then report back to him only a handful of people would take the job, and one of the first ones didn't last a month working undercover. It was embarrassing for him to constantly watch someone. Soon, Xin Yan realized Wentum's plan and stopped hiring new people for fear of being suspected of something. From 2003 to 2008, he frequently changed the location of his factory to avoid running into Wentum. In the summer of 2006, a local lawyer named Jan Tinchin was walking along the Cheshui Trail with friends and at one point felt cold and uneasy, as if someone had died in the area. This feeling did not leave him for several weeks. A little later, meeting with the head of the criminal investigation department near Tanaka City, Tinchan learned of an unsolved case and its unidentified victim. Without hesitation, he decided to make a short documentary on the case and boldly declared that he would reveal the victim's identity on live television using methods similar to a Ouija session. However, in order to do so, he needed the body, which at the time was in the morgue in a freezer. He held a seance on air, but the program ended with the body still unidentified. But the program was very popular with the public. John Wentham was one of those who watched the program when it was broadcast, and this made him even more determined to prove that the body belonged to Chen Xinli. By this time, he had convinced his superiors to reopen the case, and the investigation began a second time. At the same time, Xin Yan remained the prime suspect. The police decided to do what Wentum had previously attempted and sent secret informants posing as potential hires to the factory. However, Xin Yan was still cautious and did not fall for such bait. The next step was to pit Qin Yan and Huichi against each other. In March 2009, an undercover policeman, along with a team from television and the electric company, infiltrated the factory under the pretext of filming a program about electricity theft. As it happened, the stolen electricity was indeed found in the factory, resulting in Qin Yan being fined and $700,000. This plan worked as Wentum intended because the factory was already struggling. Each year was worse than the previous one, and this huge fine was the last straw. Chinyan and Huichi had a big quarrel. It came to the point of parting. A few days later, still not recovered from the conflict, Huichi approached Chinyan's daughter, Xu Ting, and said, Do you want to know what happened to your mother? Just ask your father. Whenever Tsin Yan visited his daughter, she would deliberately try to get him drunk in the hope that he would accidentally blab and tell her what he had done to Tsin Li. Eventually, Xu Ting managed to crack the already drunken father. He confessed that Tsin Li was dead. In his drunken delirium, he also mentioned burning the body and beating it with a stick. However, he claimed that he had not killed her and that he had no time to stop the mayhem either. Since there was no direct confession to the murder and some of the details were told under the influence of alcohol, by law the police could not arrest him. In April 2009, Xu Ting went rogue and told her father that she really knew everything and that her brothers also knew the truth and that he should turn himself in to the police. She also lied to him, saying that if anything happened to her, 
her brothers would definitely go to the police and tell them everything. The ruse succeeded. Tsin Yan confessed to the murder. However, he was in no hurry to go to the police station because of some unfinished business. Unfortunately, Xu Ting let him finish all the cases before he spontaneously surrendered to the authorities. It came to the point that Hui Qi, along with his two children from his previous marriage, Zhen Feng and Xin Yan Hong, approached Xu Ting's house and began to intimidate and taunt her and her mother. Hui Qi's children openly stated that Xin Li was dead and that she was killed by their ex-husband. They also repeatedly mentioned that their mother, Hui Qi, was also involved in the murder. Xu Ting heard all this but did not leave the house. Instead, she called the police. However, the police never came for some reason, so she called Wentum, who rushed over after a few minutes and arrested the whole family. Having already arrived at the police station, Wentum notified the police that it was worth arresting two more factory workers named Zhang Yucheng, who was 24 years old, and Su Chunkai, who was 23 years old. It turned out that both of them were also involved in Xin Li's murder. The officers decided to hold off on questioning Qin Yan and Hui Qi, and instead focused on the factory workers and Hui Qi's children. Her two sons didn't say anything, naturally, but Yu Cheng and Chun Kai confessed that they had helped in Xin Li's murder, for which Xin Yan and Hui Qi were responsible. They also confirmed that the body found on the Cheshui Trail belonged to the missing Xin Li. Later, Xin Yan and Hui Qi, unable to withstand the pressure of the police, confessed to everything. However, Xin Yan claimed that Hui Qi was the mastermind behind the murder. The idea came about when Xin Li started to harass them and cause them trouble. They didn't think that the woman would desperately fight for her life. On August 2, 2002, Hui Qi rented a minibus and initiated two factory workers into the plan. She also lied to them that Xin Li allegedly often underpaid them and prevented her husband from paying them more. This information was meant to anger the men, which actually happened. True, they were motivated to take revenge on Xin Li, not to kill her. That same day, Xin Yan went to a neighbor's house where Xin Li was playing cards. There, he convinced his ex-wife to meet him at the bridge in Jiantai Ping. The woman agreed, and upon arrival, Qin Yan suggested that she drink some wine to make the conversation easier. The wine had sleeping pills in it, and as soon as Xin Li drank it, she passed out. Half the job was done. Qin Yan, following the plan, called Hui Qi, who was waiting at home. Half an hour later, she arrived at the bridge. They loaded Xin Li into the van and stopped by the factory, where they picked up the tools they would later use to kill her. After that, they went to a rural mountain area and ordered their workers, Chu Ankai and Yu Chen, to strangle Xin Li with a towel. However, the towel was too short, making it impossible to strangle her. Moreover, Xin Li regained consciousness and began to resist. The two workers could no longer restrain the victim, so Xin Yan and Hui Qi got off the bus, grabbed sticks, and started beating Xin Li. They thought it would kill her, but it didn't. The woman was still alive. Then Xin Yan became even more aggressive, throwing punches. Xin Li cried and squirmed in pain, but the abuse didn't stop. Xin Yan no longer knew how to kill her. The first thing that came to his mind was to douse Xin Li with gasoline and set her on fire. For a full two minutes, she burned, remaining conscious and feeling all the pain until she finally fell silent. When the body finished burning and was extinguished before any of the villagers noticed the fire, Xin Yan and Hui Qi poured the lye solution on the victim's face, chest, and fingers. All four of them then put her body in a plastic bag and disposed of it in Chishwiki Forest Park. The next day, the killers also burned the clothes and the murder weapon, then went home and continued to live as if nothing had happened. On May 14, 2009, Authorities exhumed the body and conducted a second autopsy to see if the injuries matched the details of the confession. The medical examiner observed blunt force trauma wounds on the victim's remains that the previous coroner had missed. The front of the victim's body was badly burned 
and there were traces of smoke in the airways, confirming the killer's account that Sinley had been burned alive. All the details matched, and finally, DNA was taken from the body and compared to the DNA of Sinley's three children. The results matched, and the body was finally identified as Chen Sinley. The trial took place in Taiwan's Supreme Court, and both the court and the prosecutor did not believe any of the defendants when they tried to claim that only others were responsible. For example, Yu Chen and Chuan Shai claimed that they did not know the plan involved murder and were tricked into it. But the court rejected this claim. Huichi also claimed that she didn't know they were going to kill Xin Li and only beat her with sticks under Qin Yan's coercion. Qin Yan himself accused Huichi several times of being the mastermind behind such brutality. He claimed that Xin Li wanted to remarry him and so he often quarreled with Huichi about it. None of the judges and prosecutors believed them. Of course, on November 18, 2010, all four were found guilty. Workers Yu Chen and Chun Kai each received eight years imprisonment. Huichi was sentenced to 18 years in prison. Qin Yan Yang received the highest sentence, life imprisonment without parole. As the court felt that he was the one who came up with the idea to kill his ex-wife and inspired others to take part in the brutality. The case became a sensation in Taiwan and caused public outrage. The people were furious at the abysmal performance of the Changhua police who failed to solve the case and identify the victim. The forensic examiner failed to notice obvious wounds and traces of smoke in the victim's lungs. Taichung police were also heavily criticized for how long it took them to recognize that the body was Xinli's. Many attribute the solving of the case solely to John Wentung. It is believed that if it wasn't for him, Chen Xinli would still be unidentified and her murder would have remained unsolved. Thanks for watching, friends. What do you think about this story? Share your thoughts in the comments. I'm always interested in your opinions. Subscribe to my channel. There's much more to come. See you next time.